Uh, okay, so it kind of starts with this uh, so-called orange book, um, which goes by the name, uh, technical, technically is known as the Trusted Computing System Evaluation Commission, oh, TC, SEC, orange book. I keep saying, just remember orange book. Uh, so that, that came out in 1983. Why do they call it the orange book, do you suppose? Because the cover was orange, right? In fact, uh, this was a group at NSA that was doing this for the Department of Defense, and they produced a whole series of books. Every book had a different colored cover, so they called them the Rainbow Series. <laughs> and this one just happened to be the orange book. Um, and this one is the one everybody remembers. I think the rest of it's all kind of faded away. So it's, uh, you know, it's not that big for a government document. I mean, 115 pages, I don't know how they kept it so small. <laughs> and, uh, it's pretty concise, actually. Um, and it's kind of weird. This is really has almost a religious fervor to it. There's some people out there who think, you know, we really went astray by not following the Orange Book. If we'd only follow you know, their guidance, you know, we'd be much more secure and all that sort of stuff today. Uh, I'm not one of those people, although you may have somebody in the department who's one of those people, but I won't mention any names. Okay. But, you know, it's kind of fading away as time goes by. That was true in the past. Okay, so they set two goals with this orange book. Uh, one was, you know, really the certification process. Okay, a way that you could get your product certified so you could sell it to the government. Okay, that was important for people who wanted to sell the product to the government. But beyond that, they also had sort of a, almost like a philosophical part to the document that told you how you could build more secure systems. Okay, and that's the part that people kind of got all hung up on, thought was really something uh, special. We're gonna mostly look at this and we'll kind of give you an idea, I guess, as to what they were thinking with this, with this other stuff here. Okay, now there's four divisions, they call them, and they're, uh, not, they're labeled D through A. So D being the lowest, the least secure, and A being the highest, or most secure. Uh, each division, or most of the divisions, are split into numbered classes. The higher the number, the better. Okay, okay so divisions and classes. Okay, so let's start at the bottom, work our way up. Uh, part, uh, Division D, they call that minimal protection. And, you know, that's kind of silly. Why would you submit your product and get try to get it certified? And basically, you can't get anything else, so you get minimal certification. I guess that means you tried, but you failed. <laughs> you know, it really doesn't uh, say much about your product. The next step up, uh, they call discretionary uh, protection. The idea here is that the product doesn't force you to be secure, but if you do something that's not secure, it will probably catch you, or it will know that you did something secure. Someone could find out that you did something insecure, okay? Well, how do you do that? How do you find something without actually forcing somebody? Well, you're gonna have some kind of logs, right? Some kind of record of what people did. And that's really what it comes down to. Some sort of audit trail is produced so people could look and see that you had done something that you're not supposed to be doing, okay? Uh, there's two, uh, two classes here, uh, C1 and C2, discretionary security protection and controlled access protection. Don't ask me. You know, you can read the document all day, and I guarantee you, you won't see much difference between these two. But basically the way it works is whatever it describes here, you have to do here plus a few additional little things. Okay, so it's supposed to be more secure you know, in, in some sense. Okay, B, now it's kind of interesting. You know, C is, you know, it basically the level C has some security. So it has a little bit of a sense of security. It's trying to catch you if you do something wrong, you know, that sort of thing. But B is like a huge step up from C, okay? It's not just trying to catch you, it's trying to prevent you from doing anything insecure. Yeah. Uh, these sites are not been uh, updated? These what? Uh, on your website? These sites um, Maybe not. They'll be <laughs> updated soon. <laughs> okay. All right. 
So, okay, so this is a big step up. So C, you can break the security, but you'll probably get caught. Okay, B, it's mandatory. I mean, you don't have a choice. You cannot break the security. You're not supposed to be able to break the security. Uh, and they call it labeled security protection. Or, uh, okay, so there's different uh, classes here. So the first one is labeled security protection. So think of like access control, right? You're trying to access a particular piece of data. So every piece of data is supposed to have some label associated with it that says what you're allowed to do with it. So if you try to do something you're not allowed, it's labeled and it says you can't do that, so you're not allowed to do it. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, and you can't get around that, uh, hopefully. Okay, now B2, everything you do in B1, right, it's still labeled, it's all that sort of protection, but it adds protection against covert channels. Uh, what are covert channels? Well, we'll talk about that later, <laughs> uh, maybe next time. Um, it's kind of weird to me that they put this in here because covert channels are sort of an esoteric kind of topic people don't usually worry too much about, but here it is kind of in the middle of this particular uh, uh, category. Um, but anyway, B3, everything in B2 plus what else? Uh, this is a big deal too, right? So they really, you know, sort of make a big leap from here to here. They want you to make sure your software is tamper-proof, okay? Um, well, what about this business about being small? Why would your software be small? What's good about that? Less chances for bugs. That's right, okay, fewer chances of bugs. Easier for somebody to analyze and see if it really does what it's supposed to do. If it's really tamper-proof and all that. They detect the definition of small. I won't ask you what it is, but you know, that, I don't think there is one. <laughs> um, here's an example of the stuff they have in this uh, orange book. So there's one place where they talk about testing, right? And they say, okay, if you're going to meet, I forget, one of these categories, right? They say you have to test your software for, you know, they try to be precise. They say something like you have to test your software for at least three weeks. I don't know, to me that doesn't mean anything, right? I mean, you could have one group test their software, you know, press enter for, you know, three weeks and nothing breaks and it's great. You could have another guy write a script and, you know, test the software more thoroughly in an hour, right? So, you know, so, you know, that sort of stuff I don't think is too well thought out. It's more of a philosophical sort of statement in a sense. Okay, what about this? Make your software tamper-proof. What do they mean by that? I don't know, but that's pretty hard to do even today, right? Thinking about making your software tamper-proof, as we'll see when we talk about uh, software. You know, so, you know, this is 1983. You know, really, to make your code tamper-proof was kind of beyond the <coughs> point. Yeah. I worked with tamper-proof code a little bit, just because of viruses. You can always do things like check some on resources, but certainly finds it's a question of what kind of tampering you're allowed to do. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly what they're thinking of uh, as far as uh, tamper proofing, but you know, uh, if you give somebody your software and they haven't, you know, administrative privileges and they have access to it, you know, to prevent somebody, really prevent somebody from tampering with it is very difficult to do, you know, on an open platform and all that sort of stuff. Um, you're asking for a lot there, okay. Um, Maybe in certain cases, you know, where you have more restrictions on, you know, how people get access to it and so on, you could do something, but in general, that's pretty hard to do. Uh, okay, then you go up to the A division. Okay, that's the highest level, right? Uh, and they talk about using, uh, you know, everything you have below, okay, tamper-proof software and all the covert channel protection and all that fancy stuff. Uh, but then they want formal methods. Okay, what do we mean by formal methods here? Anybody? Ever done any of that stuff? Uh, they're talking about really proofs, rigorous proofs that your software does what it's supposed to do. You can, there are there's a technique called formal methods where you can prove your software does what it's supposed to do. This is 1983, right? Formal methods was like you know in its infancy, and even today, using formal methods to really rigorously prove that a piece of software does what it's supposed to do is pretty limited. You can do that for small, you know, not too complex pieces of software, but large, sort of realistic things. It's very hard to do. Yeah. I think I remember about formal methods. One of the problems with it is that you have to abstract from the software to get the mathematical model you're proving. If there are bugs that you miss in the abstraction, you're 
Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of research into formal methods, and there actually are people today who uh, claim that it works, at least in sort of moderately complex cases. But, you know, for typical pieces of software that you would write, it's a very big undertaking to think about applying formal methods, and there are potential pitfalls along the way. Yeah. Can any pieces of software actually go through the A division? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. This is so old, but wait till we get to the modern version of this. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. So that's a good thought. I mean, could anybody actually do this? In 1983, I have my doubts. Right? That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. So there's a second part to all this, which really goes into the rationale. What were they thinking? And how would you design secure systems in general? And that's the part where people sort of you know, have this philosophical position that if you'd only followed the orange book, you know, and followed their way of doing things, you know, things would be much more secure. Uh, to my mind, it tends to be pretty theoretical, and it's sort of a, you know, I'm sort of down here. It's kind of a dead end. Uh, didn't really lead anywhere. Wasted a lot of effort. People, it's particularly academic effort, was focused on this and trying to prove things and trying to make it rigorous, which is nice if it works, but if it doesn't work, you know, you kind of wasted your time. And that's sort of what happened. Uh, uh, and this is kind of a little pet peeve of mine, you know, it's not really directly related here, but these people who came up with the Orange Book, these people at NSA and all those government security people, um, they now try to set educational standards in security, which really annoys me to know. 